All right, uh, thanks so much. So, um, yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. It's uh, really nice to be here, I guess. Uh, so, um, I'm gonna talk about basically some connections. You know, IPAM is about connections, so these arrows represent connections, and I'm assuming that a lot of people care about bipartite graphs in the plane, and you know, maybe about some subset of these things. So I'm gonna tell you about the three geometric objects you can associate to a planar bipartite graph uh, in this order. And uh, throughout, I'm gonna basically focus on something called uh, reduced bipartite graphs in a disk, uh, but uh, you should keep in mind that uh, there are other interesting classes of planar graphs, so of planar bipartite graphs. So uh, the, first of all, you don't have to assume that they're reduced. I'm gonna define this later. And uh, also you can assume, you can, maybe you're interested in graphs on a torus instead of, or any other surface maybe, cylinder, which many people are. So uh, yeah, and a lot of these things could be developed for these other cases, but nobody has thought about this. So yeah, this is like, there's gonna be a bunch of open problems. And uh, yeah, so I'm gonna start with some background on how, let's say, I like to think about planar bipartite graphs. So, uh, and uh, I'm gonna, I was gonna try to say planar bipartite throughout the talk, but I'm always gonna, like, after a few minutes, I'm gonna say Playbic. So uh, Playbic means planar bicolored. And the difference is that some, I mean, it's every vertex is white or black, but um, it doesn't have to be bipartite. And so if you care about bipartite, you can always insert a little vertex in the middle of every such edge, and so then it becomes bipartite in the usual sense of the word. Okay, and uh, so here is a definition. Let me pin down exactly what I mean by a play big graph. So yeah, it's a graph. For me, it's going to be in, in a disk with n boundary vertices of degree one. Okay, so here are the five boundary vertices in, in this example. And so every vertex is colored black and white. I'm going to assume all boundary vertices are black. Doesn't really matter. And uh, so one important notion uh, for a playback graph is the notion of a strand. Uh, many people call it zigzag paths. Uh, the, the way it's defined is it's a path in a, in a playback graph which uh, makes a sharp right turn at every black vertex and a sharp left turn at every white vertex. Okay, so like on the roundabout, you take the first right or the first left. Um, yeah, so here's an example of a strand. It's, it's a path on the graph, but I'm drawing it slightly, like I'm, I'm making it pass through the midpoints of the edges, where it turns right at the black vertex, then left at the white vertex, right, left, right. Okay, yeah. Do you require that all the vertices have degree three? Or is uh, it just well, coincidence? Uh, Not no, I chose this picture to have to be trivalent, right? So all the interior vertices are trivalent because it's gonna be important later, but for now, yeah, it doesn't matter. You can contract this edge, you can contract all the unicolored edges and get a bipartite graph. That's another way to think of this. Uh, yeah, so that's one strand. Here's another one, it goes left, right, left. Here's another one, another one, another one. Yeah, so um, um, you get basically, I mean, if a strand starts at the boundary, it has to terminate at the boundary. Sometimes you may have closed strands inside the disk, but every edge belongs to two strands which go in the opposite direction. And uh, so, Using the strands, you can define the notion of a reduced or minimal Playbic graph. Basically, um, a graph is reduced if it satisfies the following conditions. So it has um, no closed strands in the interior, right? Every strand starts and terminates at the boundary. Also, there is no self-intersecting strands. And uh, yeah, so here, this is a little bit subtle. Uh, if you have two strands, which intersect twice, right? They're allowed, uh, they're not allowed to pass in the same direction from one intersection point to the other. Okay, they have to pass in the opposite direction. So that is allowed, this is not allowed. And, and, and that may look unnatural, but it's actually, yeah. There is another way to define reduced, which is to say like, it has the minimal number of faces along all graphs, among all graphs with the same like strand permutation, uh, which I haven't, yeah, let me, so let me actually write down, so. 
uh, out of all reduced playback graphs, there is one important class called KN playback graphs. which are assumed to be reduced. Uh, again, this means that there is no closed trends, no self-intersectance trends, and no bad double crossings. And the second condition is that this trend permutation, right? So uh, if you label the boundary versus one through n, then uh, strand permutation sends uh, i to i plus k modulo f for all i. So let me illustrate this by an example. It's unclear if these objects even exist. So here's an example. We label the boundary reverses 1 through n clockwise. And uh, you look at the strands. So 1 goes to 3. and uh, 2 goes to 4, and 3 goes to 5, 4 goes to 6, which is 1 modulo n, and uh, 5 goes to 7, which is 2 modulo n. Okay? And you can check that any two strands that intersect twice, they intersect in the opposite direction. So um, this is a kn playback graph for k equals 2 and n equals 5. All right, any questions up to this point? Okay. Uh, now let me also. What is opposite, sorry, what is opposite direction? Uh, so if you have two intersection points, right? One strand goes from this point to this. Like it, the strands are directed. So. Uh, so two intersection points. You have a loop. Yeah, you have um, <laughs> you have two strands which form like a closed. So it's a condition on two intersection points, not one intersection point. Yeah, it, it's a condition on pairs of strands. Pairs of strands are allowed to intersect multiple times, but they have to traverse the intersection points in the opposite direction. All right. Uh, okay, so let me also define another important uh, uh, thing associated to a playback graph, which is face labels. So I'm going to label every face by a, of a reduced playback graph by a k element set. And the way it's going to work is so here's a two element set. Uh, the way it works is using the strands. Uh, basically, for any strand, so here, let's say, here's the strand which terminates at one. So it divides the disk into two parts, and so I add one to the sets which are to the left of the strand. Okay, so uh, I put one everywhere here, and I put a two everywhere here because this strand terminates at two, three, four, five. So yeah, and because every edge belongs to two strands in the opposite direction, all sets have the same size, uh, which is uh, k in this case. Um, so, you know, I should mention that uh, basically, well, first of all, you can even draw the dual graph. Right? So you, you can draw the dual graph whose vertices correspond to faces, so the vertices are labeled by sets, right? And uh, every, uh, every white vertex is going to give rise to a white face of the dual graph, and, uh, and the, boundary, the boundary vertices are always going to be labeled by cyclic intervals. So like 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 1, 5. For a k and play the graph, that's what's going to happen. Um, yeah, and so I should mention that uh, this was this construction is uh, important in the in the work of of these people who proved the purity conjecture of Leclerc and Zulinski. Yeah. Um, so I may have missed something. The these k you, you mentioned the minimal graphs. Are these k n play graphs always minimal? Yeah. Yeah. Well, for me, minimal means reduced. But uh, yeah, yeah, they're all. Um, Basically, they have minimal number of faces. Uh, reduced is already minimal. Yeah, yeah, okay. it, it's kind of a different terminology, but yeah, it's the same. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's all I need to know about playback graphs for now. Let me try to talk about the first kind of geometric object, which uh, is going to look like this. It's a, it's a three-dimensional object. So, um, but I'm going to start uh, with the beginning, basically. Here's the definition of Minkowski sum. If you have two sets uh, in RD, then there is Minkowski sum is just the set of pairwise sums. And uh, 
And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a vector configuration, which is a bunch of vectors, and I'm going to associate to it a zonotope, which by definition is the Minkowski sum of line segments from zero to each vector. Okay. Uh, example, let me give you, it's, it's nice to draw some two-dimensional examples. So if I take two vectors, I take the Minkowski sum of two line segments, I get a parallelogram. And uh, if I take, if I add another vector, right, then I, like to every point in the parallelogram, I should add uh, a vertical line segment. So I get a strip, I add an extra strip like this. And so my zonotope is a hexagon in this case. And more generally, if I take four vectors, like I'm always going to get a centrally symmetric 2n gone, where every vector is going to appear twice at the boundary, like in the clockwise, counterclockwise direction. Yeah, so two-dimensional zonotopes are easy, and yeah, I'm going to focus on three-dimensional ones. But before that, let me define uh, zonotopal tilings. So uh, here is a definition. Basically, what you want to do, uh, I'm always going to talk about fine zonotopal tilings, which by definition is you want to subdivide your big zonotope into small zonotopes. And you want the pieces to be as small as possible. And what, what does it mean to be small, as small as possible? It means that you take uh, vectors which form a basis of RD, right? you take a subset of your vectors which form a basis. And so then the corresponding tile is going to be like a parallelogram or parallelotope, whatever that means. And uh, yeah, so this is a, an example of a not fine zonotopal tiling because there is one of the pieces is a hexagon, and hexagon is not a parallelogram. And if you subdivide it like this, uh, then you know, every piece is a parallelogram, so you get a fine zonotopal tiling. And yeah, in, in the plane, they're known also as like rhombus tilings or lozenge tilings in some cases. And uh, yeah, and so in particular, uh, it's convenient to label. You can label the vertices of a tiling of a fine zonotopal tiling by sets. And the way this works is you label the origin by the empty set, and then whenever you go along some vector, so let's say I went along V1 here, so I add one to my face label. So yeah, all, all the, every edge is gonna be parallel to some, to some vector, and so everywhere along that edge I add like a two to my set label, yeah. No, this is R2. Right? It, this picture looks kind of three-dimensional, but it's really a two-dimensional polygon subdivided into parallelograms. Any other questions? I guess I'm, I'm asking because if you need a basis of R2, but you're using three? Uh, so every, um, every piece, every little, yeah, I'm using four vectors. Oh, I yeah, see. But every piece is spanned every by two vectors. Is, is two, I see. Yeah. So when you consider the subdivisions, you are only allowed to use VIs that were in the initial set. Is that yeah, all? yeah, it's kind of uh, almost like a correlate. But yeah, I'm only allowed to use VIs. I, I could use something that's smaller, and I'm not allowed to do that. For example. Sorry, one more question: Are you using all possible bases, or is there some connection uh, between like the? It's a theorem that you are going to use every possible basis exactly once. Yeah, so the number of I should get. For just two parallelograms in this picture. Any other questions? All right. So, yeah, so you label the vertices by sets. And uh, that's in two dimensions. Now let's try three dimensions. Uh, and so I'm going to start with a particular vector configuration, which is called cyclic vector configuration. And for us, it's just going to mean that all endpoints of the vectors belong to the same like to the z equals one plane, and they form a convex polygon in that plane. Okay. And so I'm going to denote this by C and three, and the associated zonotope is denoted Z and three. So that's the cyclic, cyclic zonotope. And that's, here's the smallest cyclic zonotope, which is spanned by just three vectors. So it's, it's what my typical tile is going to look like in three dimensions. So yeah, if you, if you look at the tile, right, and because all vectors uh, endpoints lie on the same level, you can, you can look at sections of this picture by like 
by planes where z is some integer. Right, so I'm going to re refer to these integers as levels. So at different levels, I get different sections, and a single tile is going to give me like just vertices at the at the two outer le levels, and is going to give me triangles. Right? A section of a cube is a triangle, uh, so I'm going to have two triangles, and uh, I'm going to color the bottom one white and the top one black. Right, so every cube is oriented, so every uh, I mean, I can distinguish between the two triangles. I, I can also look at the face labels and like take the intersection here. The intersection has size like uh, one less than the size of the set. Here, the union has the size one more than the size of the set. So yeah, you can distinguish between black and white triangles kind of naturally in a fine notable telling. And uh, so I think that's it. So I can yeah I can state the theorem. So here is a theorem which is some relation between k and play the graphs and uh, the notable tilings. So the way it works is uh, you start with the cyclic zonotope. Right, you take, here I took five vectors in R3 and I took the Minkowski sum, so that's, I get some kind of polytope which, which looks like this. And, uh, and then I'm supposed to take horizontal sections. So I, I, I take horizontal sections at integer levels and so at every level, I'm going to get a poly like a pentagon with a boundary labeled by cyclic intervals. And uh, then I should take a fine zonotopal tiling of this guy. So I subdivide this big polytope into little cubes. And so when I take a section, every cube is going to give me a white triangle somewhere and a black triangle at the next level. So the picture on the left is going to get subdivided into black and white triangles, and uh, so then I'm supposed to focus on a single level, so let's say level K, maybe take level two here, yeah? Uh, so every cube is oriented, so the bottom, uh, for every cube there is a bottom triangle and a top triangle, so the bottom one is white, the top one is black. So in particular all the triangles here are white, all the ones here are black. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah, so you take, you fix some level and you look at the horizontal section at that level. So uh, what you see is a triangulation of a polygon into black and white triangles. And the, the vertices are labeled by sets, naturally. And so the claim is that if you take the, the planar dual, uh, you're going to get a KN a trivalent KN playbook graph. And, uh, and it's a, in some sense, it's a bijection. Any trivalent KN playbook graph can be obtained this way. And uh, there are some compatibility, basically any finds notable tiling gives you a bunch of compatible KN playbook graphs at different levels. So yeah, you kind of get a bunch of intuition for, for free from this theorem. Any questions? Yeah. Is the three in set N3 and the three in trivalent connected? Uh, no, no, no. The trivalent, no. Yeah. So there isn't the like, four dimensional. Like to, to find. Yeah. There isn't the four dimensional variant that gives you. Uh, no, yeah, we tried to look for like arbitrary, what happens for arbitrary zonotopes, and it's trickier. It's a little trickier than, yeah. Thank you. Uh, okay. Yeah. Is it like compatible? Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, what does it mean to be compatible? Um, I, can, I can give a different, for you it means weaves. It's, it's your paper about weaves, it's the same, yeah. Uh, but, but uh, I mean, it, yeah, you can, you can go, if I give you a play the graph, you can, you can take pairwise intersections. For every edge, you can take pairwise intersections of, of two sets for every edge. So you get a collection of sets which is of size one smaller and that's going to be a collection of face labels for a play graph one level smaller. But you have to, it's going to be like, this is not enough information, you have to uncontract some vertices, so yeah. All right, so let me also mention uh, briefly the moves for, there's moves for play graphs, there's moves for fine zonotopal tilings. So I'm going to start with zonotopal tilings. Uh, 
Basically, if you take d vectors in d dimensions, they're going to form just a single tile. But if you take d plus 1 vectors in d dimensions, they're going to form a, an interesting zonotope. And so that zonotope is always going to have exactly two fine zonotopal tilings. So here I took three vectors in the plane, and uh, here are the two possible zonotopal tilings of that zonotope. So um, again, this looks three-dimensional, but it's actually just a hexagon with two, two tilings. So whenever I find a local picture which looks like this, I can replace it with a local picture that looks like this, and that is called a flip. Okay, so that's the flip for zonotopal tilings. And uh, what, uh, I mean, it's nice to draw two-dimensional pictures. Let me try to show you a three-dimensional picture. So here is, I took four vectors uh, in R3, right? And uh, I claim that this polytope has only two fine zonotopal tilings. Uh, let me show you. So the first one, each of them consists of four cubes. So you can see there is like one three in the middle, and that's one zonotopal tiling. And, and the other one is going to be like the upside down version of this. So one, two, three, four. Yeah, there's a two four in the middle. So and these are the only two possibilities. Uh, and uh, so this is a flip. To go from here to here is a flip. And uh, yeah, that's on the zonotopal tiling side. What happens on the Playby graph side? There's this theorem for the disk, it's due to Postnikov. Um, basically, any two Playby graphs which are reduced and have the same strand permutation can always be related to each other by a sequence of moves like this. And uh, so there is a similar theorem due to Ziegler, which is that any two fine zonotopal tilings are connected by flips. So you can ask, like, what is the relation between these two theorems? And in some sense, I want to say that, like, this one implies this one, because the, the moves for Playby graphs are sections, are horizontal sections of flips for fine zonotopal tilings. So to show you a picture, um, let's say I take this polytope, and I take one of the two fine zonotopal tilings, and I take the horizontal sections. So what I'm going to see is that, I mean, I can show you, yeah, I have, I prepared these slides back in the day, and so I was very diligent about the drawing the pictures. So yeah, every, every triangle in this picture is going to belong to exactly one of those four, four cubes. So one, two, three, four. Yeah, so you can see that every, for every cube I get one white triangle and one black triangle. And so yeah, this is, I'm just trying to convince you that these are the sections that I'm going to see. And uh, if you take the planar dual, then you're, uh, you're going to see exactly the three, I mean, I had the three moves, and this is one half of each move, right? So, um, so if you apply a flip here, what you're going to do is going to amount to applying move M1 at the bottom, M2 in the middle, and M3 at the top. So a single flip for zone double tiling is just three simultaneous moves for three compatible play graphs. Yeah. And... Um, Basically, that's all I, I want to say for zonotopal tilings. Let me just add a few small comments. So, as I mentioned, you get any trivalent Playby graph like this. So, it's really kind of a very strong correspondence. And also, this construction is useful for, like, if you know about secondary polytopes, you know, a secondary polytope is a polytope whose vertices correspond to triangulations and whose edges correspond to moves of, like, flips of triangulations. So, and it turns out that using zonotopal tilings, there is like a similar story for Playby graphs. There is, there is a polytope whose vertices correspond to KN Playby graphs and edges correspond to square moves. We call it the higher associohedron. And just to briefly show you the picture, if you, let's say you take K equals three and N equals six, and you take your computer and you see that there is like 34 KN Playby graphs. And if you look at which ones are connected by moves, you see a picture like this. Uh, yeah, that, I was actually, I was my, in my first year of grad school and some uh, older student showed me, yeah, she showed me this, this picture and I was yeah, intrigued for like five years. Like why, why, why does it look like a polytope? And that, it, it's not quite a polytope. There's like an extra, there's extra two vertices which are uh, 
which spoil this B in a polytope. And so what you can see from the notable tilings is that there's some notion of a regular Playby graph, which is, if you know about secondary polytopes, there's a notion of a regular triangulation or a coherent triangulation. So yeah, you can define Playby graphs in the same way. And so if you remove these two non-regular vertices, then you get a, an honest polytope. Sorry, what's the action? Say again. What is the, can you, what is one of those non-regular graphs? Uh, it depends on the, it depends on choosing the original vector configuration. So, uh, yeah, for, for any choice of vector configuration, you're going to get exactly two non-regular triangulations. Okay, so very it, bottom and very top, or? Uh, no, they're in the, it's a k equals 3, n equals 6. So this is all happening in the middle section, horizontal section of a zonotope. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's going to be a hexagon in the middle, and then, so yeah, there's two playbook graphs in a hexagon, which are, they, they look all right, but they're actually not regular. Any other questions? So if we keep the, the bad points, do we get like an abstract polytope in some sense? Or yeah, there is there are some uh, Bowes problem, which is even for triangulations, like if you keep the non-regular triangulations, there is like a conjecture of whether this cell complex you get is homeomorphic to a sphere or something like this. Uh, yeah, I think it's still open, yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Um. So or, I'm just thinking about positroids. Are are these vertices? The, like, because for every play, playbook graph, you you have your positroid. Are you looking at the like somewhat of a polytope of the positroids as the vertices, or is it uh, right? So, so I mean, this story is only for the for my favorite positroid, which is the K and playbook graphs all have the same positroid. And you may ask, like, what, what's the extension of this story for other positroids? And uh, I thought about, oh, like, you get a sub set, subset of the, of the zonotope, but it's kind of not a very nice subset. So, yeah, that story is not fully developed. All right. So, um, yeah. And another comment for... Uh, sure. Yeah? Sorry. But uh, if you had to go, go to high, so not 3, 6, but uh, 4, 8 or something? Yeah. You should have... And will there be more non-regular? Yeah, you're getting more non-regular playbook graphs, but the regular ones are going to form an like an n minus one dimensional or n minus three dimensional polytope. Yeah. Do you know how the number of non-regulars grow? Uh, pretty fast. Like usually for triangulations, there's many more non-regular ones than re I think. Is that right? I think that's right. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, some some of you may care about isoradial embeddings. So if you take the vectors to be to lie on the circle, then you get an isoradially embedded playby graph at each level. So they're all you get uh, isoradial graphs come in packs of compatible ones at different levels. So and the edge weights you can relate the edge weights nicely. And uh, yeah, finally, so if you do care about graphs on the torus, yeah, Terence and I, Terence George and I had been talking about this, and it seems like everything works for the torus. You just uh, you get instead of Zonotopal tilings of a single zonotope, you get kind of like periodic tilings of, of R3, basically. You get horizontal sections of these kind of periodic tilings. So, uh, not sure if that's, uh, we should write this up or anything, but yeah, it's, uh, the source for the torus doesn't work for non reduced playbook graphs. So, yeah, that's uh, the part about uh, zonotopal tilings. Let me now try to focus on uh, a different. Seemingly unrelated object called uh, cluster varieties. So uh, some of you know about cluster algebras, some don't. Uh, so here is a quick reminder on cluster algebras. Basically, a quiver is a directed graph without loop arrows and without pairs of opposite arrows. Okay, and uh, and so some vertices uh, for any quiver, I'm going to assume that some vertices are frozen and the rest are mutable. So like for, for this picture here, the frozen ones are usually some kind of boundary vertices and the mutable ones are some kind of interior vertices, something like this. So yeah, some are frozen, some are mutable, and all the, there's a technical condition, that, but I just erase all the arrows between two frozen vertices. It doesn't really matter. And yeah, so given such a, any directed graph like this, you automatically get a cluster algebra. You, 
there is some machinery due to Fomin Zelensky, which like, you input a quiver and you, the output is a commutative ring. So, um, and the machinery is kind of tricky, right? So you're, what you're supposed to do is you take your quiver and you mutate a bunch of times, usually infinitely many times, and you get a bunch of rational functions called cluster variables. And you take the algebra generated by those cluster variables and that's your cluster algebra. So the definition is kind of weird. It involves an infinite sequence of mutations and the object you get may look uh, horrible. But it turns out that if your quiver was uh, nice in some sense of the word nice, then the cluster algebra you get is sort of has a geometric origin. Namely, it's the algebra, oh yeah, it turn, happens to be isomorphic to the algebra of polynomial functions on some algebraic variety. Right? So, yeah, so that's the kind of, uh, this is the geometric object that I'm going to consider associated to a Playby graph. So, even if your quiver is not nice, right, you can, yeah, if you like algebraic geometry, then to any commutative ring you can associate a scheme, right, you can, you can think of like, you probably heard that like points of the variety correspond to maximal ideals or something like this. So yeah, that's the kind of construction that you can do for any quiver and you get some sort of geometric object. So yeah, and what do I mean by nice quivers? Let me, let me look at Playby graph quivers. So uh, here's the definition of a quiver again. And um, if I start with a Playby graph, then it's planar dual, so before the planar dual was some kind of triangulation with black and white triangles. Now the planar dual is going to be a directed graph where uh, basically I ignore arrows between frozen vertices according to this sentence and I also ignore the unicolored edges but otherwise I'm for, for, I orient every arrow so that the white vertex is on the left, black vertex is on the right. And so I get a quiver for any Playby graph. And therefore, so to summarize, any Playby graph gives me a quiver, and therefore, for any Playby graph, I get a an algebraic variety. And uh, if I mean this works for any surface, any reduced, non-reduced, it doesn't matter. Uh, and uh, so, outside of the reduced case, nobody has studied these these objects. I think, even on the torus, like I don't know if anybody knows what's the cluster variety. No. Okay, no. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, uh, but for reduced Playby graphs, you get a re relatively nice variety. So you, you get what's called open positroid varieties, which I'm going to define on the next slide. And uh, they are, and maybe I shouldn't say well understood, but they are like somewhat, at least somewhat understood. And, uh, yeah, and so for non-reduced graphs on the torus, we just, it's an open problem. That one of you should solve. So, um, yeah. That's basically all you need to know about cluster algebra. It's just input, directed graph, output, algebraic variety. Any questions? Yeah? Uh, is the public graph uh, corresponding to the open Richardson or non reduced uh, Is the public graph corresponding to open Richardson non what? non reduced public graph. Uh, it's, it's not planar. Yeah, it's a 3D Playby graph. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, yeah, there is. Anyways, okay, so uh, let me define open positroid varieties for you. Because I, I, I kind of like the definition. So it's a construction due to Knudsen, Lam, and Spire. And to any rectangular matrix, I'm going to associate a permutation. And so the way it's gonna work is uh, written down here. Uh, let me explain this definition by an example. So. Here I took a, just an arbitrary two by six matrix. And I put the same matrix twice to, kind of, to make the columns periodic. So I label the columns M1, M2, up to M sub N. These are some kind of vectors in R to the K, right? So I drew, I drew these vectors in the plane in this case. And uh, the way my permutation is defined, so I take, let's say M1, and I start scanning to the right of M1. So I take the next M2, M3, M4, until the, the span of the next few columns contains M1. So that's what's written down here. Uh, so 
M1 does not belong to the span of M2, M3, M4, but if I add M5, then it belongs to the span. So my permutation is going to send 1 to 5. And then I continue kind of cyclically. So I start with column 2, and I scan to the right. So where is the permutation going to land? 3. Nice. Yeah, so 2 and 3 are parallel. So 2 goes to 3, and 3 is going to go to... Say it louder. Six. Six. Okay. Three is going to go to six, and four. This is a tricky point. So J is allowed to be equal to I. So the zero column goes to itself. That's the um, just by definition. Three six. Say again. Three six. Oh, it's the span of all the. Yeah. So you take the span of these two. Uh, yeah. All yeah. three. Yeah. So five goes to yeah. This this is where it wraps around. So five goes to two. And six goes to one. So surprisingly, I mean, it's a surprising fact that I get a permutation from this construction. But it's yeah, it's always going to be true. So yeah, what? Ha by the way, let me discuss an important example related to K and playback graphs. What happens if my matrix is completely generic? You know, no zero columns, no parallel columns. What's going to be the permutation? Uh, so M1 is not going to belong to the span of M2, but it's going to belong to the span of the next two columns. So 1 is going to go to 3, 2 to 4, 3 to 5, 4 to 1, and 5 to 2. So I'm going to get the exact same permutation that I wrote down here, which I'm going to denote by FKN. This is like the most generic permutation. And so if you think about like what are the conditions on the matrix which make sure that the permutation is generic. And you can notice that I only care about like ranks of consecutive, cyclically consecutive sets of columns. So it's enough to, to assume that uh, like if all of these cyclically consecutive maximal minors, so delta 1 up to k, 2 up to k plus 1, and 1, 2 up to k, if all of these are non-zero, then my matrix is going to have this generic permutation associated to it. Okay. So, okay, but any matrix gets a permutation. That's the bottom line of this construction. So, yeah, some properties. Let me, uh, first of all, yeah, as I said, always you do get a permutation. And uh, also, this construction is, it's invariant. If you apply invertible row operations to your matrix, that corresponds to applying a global linear transformation to R to the K, which, uh, preserves this condition. So you, this construction really descends to like ma matrices modular row operations. And matrices modular row operations is the same, it's the Grassmannian. It's the set of K planes in the n-dimensional space, right? So what I'm saying is that this construction descends to the Grassmannian. It doesn't really matter for this talk, but it, it does. And so any point in the Grassmannian, any K plane in the n-dimensional space, gets an associated permutation. And uh, this is called the positroid stratification. So you subdivide the Grassmannian into pieces labeled by permutations. And for each permutation, the corresponding piece consists of all like row spans of matrices whose associated permutation is F. Does that make sense? Yeah. So there's no colored on coloring of the fixed points for these permutations. I'm, I'm skipping the fixed. Oh, yeah, okay. there is. Yeah, because and are you? So there's you, two ways that a column can go. I'm talking about the totally non-negative Grassmannian. So, uh, yeah. So, so this is you can define this over complex numbers, over reals, any field. Uh, each of those has a totally positive part, which I'm kind of ignoring. Until next slide. So, uh, any more questions? All right, so yeah, you get these nice varieties. And uh, each, of, yeah, each of those happens to be an algebraic variety. And of those, out of all of those, there is one interesting, interesting guy which you know, there is a unique top dimensional stratum which corresponds to this permutation here. Right? The generic permutation involves almost all points in the Grassmannian and then all the other ones are kind of at the boundary. And so, yeah, you might ask, like, how is this related to playback graphs and cluster algebras? And so here is one theorem that Thomas and I proved. 
which is that if you, if you start with a reduced Playby graph uh, with a strand permutation f and you take the quiver, right? So the quiver is gonna give you a cluster algebra which is gonna give you a cluster variety. And uh, the claim is that this, I mean basically the claim is that the cluster algebra is isomorphic to the ring of polynomial functions on the corresponding positroid piece. Is it always cluster algebra or upper cluster algebra? It's cluster algebra, yeah. And, and you don't invert? Hmm? You don't invert? I do, I, we invert the horizons. Because yeah. yeah, some of the minors have to be non-zero. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's uh, based on uh, work of several groups of people and uh, some of which are here. Um, so yeah, that's the, I mean, the point of this result is just to show you that indeed you get kind of relatively nice objects for a reduced Playby graph. So it's natural to ask like what happens for non-reduced. And uh, yeah, and one quick comment for people who like dimers. So if you, like if you care about the dimer model, which you do, uh, the, you, so you start with a planar bipartite graph. And, uh, and so you can take, you can take perfect matchings, but you quickly find that there is like too many black vertices. There is a little too many, because all the boundary vertices I'm assuming are black. So there is a little too many of those. And so you can, what you can do is you can pick a K element set of boundary vertices and you can remove all the other boundary vertices. And then you can take the partition function. Right? You can, that's what people usually do. They look at the partition function of, the, of perfect matchings of this, of this kind of graph. Only here, a, a single play of graph is gonna give you like n choose K different partition functions labeled by different K element sets. And all of those, they're not gonna be completely independent. They're all gonna, it's a theorem that they're all gonna be maximal minors of, of some matrix, of some full rank K by N matrix. So a single Playby graph, this is called the boundary measurement map. A single Playby graph with edge weights gives you a point in the gross minor. So, and on the previous slide, I showed you that the, the gross minor is subdivided into positroid pieces. So this point is gonna to belong, to to belong to the piece labeled by uh, the strand permutation of my Playby graph. Okay? So even if you only care about the dimer model, uh, you can ask like, I mean, what is the, I mean, this naturally already leads to the definition of a positroid variety, just kind of looking at which points, which points in the gross minor do you get. It's uh, some motivation for you. Okay, any questions before I finish off with a totally different object? No. Can I just ask, yeah. what, what, do you, what if you don't want fixed points? What if you can like, look at the reduced matroid without fixed points? Does that change the story much? Or no, no, the, the, yeah, the fixed points don't really come into the picture at all. Any other questions? All right, so uh, knots. Yeah. The description of the conference had knots in, the, uh, in it, so I wanted to talk a little bit about knots. So take any Playby graph, reduced, non-reduced, on any surface you want, then you can uh, associate to it a knot or a link uh, in, in your surface times a circle. And the way this works is, uh, so you draw the strands, right? So here I've, uh, I took my Playby graph and I removed all the boundary vertices because they don't matter for the, for the knots perspective. And uh, yeah, so if you just draw the strands, every strand is gonna become a closed loop. And, uh, and some of them are gonna intersect. So it's not an honest link in the surface, but if you, if you lift it to the surface times a circle, uh, in the following way. So you, for every interest, for you lift any point on the strand, uh, the second coordinate is just the unit tangent vector of the strand at that point. So you know, unit tangent vectors form a circle. So you can like these two, the blue and the orange intersection points are gonna lift to different points in here because they have different tangent vectors. So you get the link in here, that's the, no, it's a very kind of general construction and it's completely, it goes back to the 70s to the work of Acampo and a bunch of other people. 
And uh, one cool thing about it is that the link you get is invariant under urban renewals or square moves or spider moves. Uh, yeah, it's just, if you apply a square move here, the, like, it's kind of easy to see from, from this description that the links are gonna be isotopic to each other. Yeah. And um, the ambient manifold is a little bit strange, right? It's a surface times a circle, which is, I mean, we're used to like the three-dimensional space, not in the three-dimensional space. So if your graph is, I mean, if your surface is the plane or the square, then, um, yeah, this is a little bit technical, but if you allow the strands to, to, to turn at the boundary, right? So if you, uh, at the boundary, if you don't care about the tangent vector of your strand, then uh, the manifold you get is actually, is gonna, instead of being this product, is gonna become just the usual three sphere. So you, the point of this is that you're, for planar graphs in the plane, you're gonna get usual knots in the three-dimensional space. Okay, if you care about graphs on the torus, then you get torus times S1, which is like S1 cubed. But yeah, I haven't thought about those. But in the plane, it's, you know, it's very nice. And uh, I can even tell you concretely what the construction is. Uh, basically, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna replace, I mean, I'm gonna tell you the actual link diagram in the plane. And the way it's gonna work is I'm gonna replace every crossing by either an over or under crossing according to the complex argument of the tangent vector. So there are strands, I'm assuming the complex ar argument is from zero to two pi. So there are strands which, uh, whose argument is close to zero and they go below all the other strands. And there are strands which, uh, whose argument is close to two pi which go above all the other strands. So, and I kind of broke the symmetry at this point I and mean, this is just, I'm, I'm taking my circle and I kind of, I'm ripping off my circle into a line segment, or something like this. So yeah, the, the extra step that you need to do to define these knots is like at every point where the argument switches from zero to two pi or vice versa, it has to, the strand has to go to the boundary above all the other strands and then turn back and go back below all the other strands. Uh, anyways. Uh, and, and so you do this for all these little squares and you get an honest link diagram, which is your knot associated to any playback graph. And uh, yeah, there is even, for reduced playback graphs, there is an even more concrete procedure, which uh, I guess, uh, uh, do I, can I have two more minutes, is that all right? Okay, yeah, so there is this, uh, for a reduced playback graph, because the knot doesn't depend on, is invariant under square moves, the link is gonna be, is only gonna depend on the permutation. Right? Because any two playby graphs are related by square moves, if they have the same strand permutation. So, uh, so for any permutation, it's, it's even easier to draw the knot. You just, so you take the torus, and if one goes to five uh, in the permutation, you draw an arrow from one to five in the northeastern direction. So, and then two goes to four, so they cross. So you draw a, an arrow of higher slope above the arrow of the lower slope. And you just continue, three goes to six, four to three, five to one, and six to two. So the colors correspond to the cycles. And, uh, and then you kind of join the endpoints. So we get a link diagram drawn on the torus. And so, that's like the easiest, the easiest construction I know. So this, we proved this with Thomas that it's the uh, same construction as the one from the previous slide for reduced playback graphs. Anyways, for reduced playback graphs, this simplifies considerably. And uh, yeah, I'm confused. say again. So originally I thought you had a link in the three sphere for a playback graph and now it's a link out there. Right, right. So uh, I'm embedding the torus in the three dimensional space. I'm just the usual, you know. Just thickening, thickening. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's a, th it's a thickened torus inside. Th yeah, so it's a, it's really a link in 3D. It's also naturally a link on the torus, which is more information than a link in 3D. But yeah, it's uh, the previous construction agrees with this one. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so you can you can study the homology of these knots, and it turns out to be related to the homology of of these cluster varieties that I talked about before. But I'm just gonna stop here, so 
Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much.